But I was going to go on talking about it some more. What is the subject? The subject I've given various titles to. Giving someone freedom is a title that I somehow stick with for reasons that escape me most of the time. Um, the subject matter, however, is, uh, is the normative in psychiatry. That is the uh, concept of the healthy. And, uh, whatever the title. And remember, my overall plan has been to examine the descriptive school in terms of its normative ideas, and then to examine psychoanalysis, particularly in the person of Eric Erickson, and then to suggest some notions, somewhat of my own, about what would be might be a viable concept of health in psychiatry. And you recall that the charge that I made against descriptive psychiatry was that it was largely without a concept of the normative. But if you examine, for example, we'll do this again in a little more detail, if you examine the mental status examination, you have, you're hard pressed, except for the neurological aspect, the calculatory aspect, to find any account of normality at all in it. Which leaves us, I suggest, up the creek without a paddle, since the analogy in medicine is very different where, of course, we have constant normative references throughout the physical examination as well as the history and laboratory findings in, in every area. <coughs> my, um, my charge against psychoanalysis was perhaps more forbidding, or at least that development of psychoanalysis, which is the most clearly an opponent of mine in the sense of representing what I think is an over-normalization of psychoanalysis. That is Erickson's life cycle. And I discuss some of the reasons that I think that concept is, is deeply ambiguous in that I didn't know how you could decide whether it was an ethical idea or an embryological idea or a sociological idea or a historical idea or what it is. And, uh, but that I think it was incontestably, whatever it may be, in other ways, incontestably, it's an ethical idea because insofar as there is a concept of normal development, it then operates as a set of ideals and foci for behavior and judgment in the, in the world at large. So that whatever it's, in, whatever it's intended to be, whatever it may really be, it operates ultimately as an ethical conception. <coughs> and, um, and of course, grounding all these remarks of mine is the contention that, that ethics, ethical conceptions have no place in medicine. And we'll come back to that. That medicine depends upon creating what is essentially a disinterested environment in which the patient comes for his own sake, not to be judged or not to be uh, assigned a, a goal in life that the church and the state uh, take up those tasks quite independently and of course very forcefully but that we have a different function. And I'll try to give you what is one of the most famous historical examples of that, the John Wilkes Booth case, a uh, man who assassinated Lincoln. Uh, talk a little bit about that. It's a vivid illustration of what our essential position is. Indeed, of course, the Hippocratic Oath, and the, and, and, and the one thing about medical ethics that seems to be very clear, and that is that the medical clinical situation is not to be exploited for the purposes of the doctor's own ideas about anything health. But of course, that, that's where the ambiguities begin to crowd in, what is health. <clears throat> so we have, to, we have to come up with some notion of health, but can we do it in a way that's relatively value-free and, and at the same time fills in the very negative picture that descriptive psychiatry has left us with? And that's really the considerable assignment that I've so sort of stumbled into, not having intended by any stretch of the imagination to get into it, but it seems to be necessary. And you can see already the kind of answer I would be tending to give because this, the title of all these talks is Language and Mind and Psychotherapy. So essentially what I'll be doing is presenting the concept of mind that, to, that will contain normative features. And the analogy, of course, will be to the body, which has normative features. The concept of the healthy body that's you know, changing as we develop know more about the body, but that nevertheless has fairly stable content. <clears throat> well, that's that's the outline of the whole thing. Now, let me go back over parts of it, see if I can deepen the argument a little bit here and there, and then try to advance into this. Again. 
aspect of, of, of the normative. In the positive way, rather than simply the negative way, I've been attacking the other school. <coughs> I um, remember I said that, and I think it's I think it's plain, and I hope you won't be cowed by my arrogance in agreeing with me. But it seems to me plain that, that the only parts of the mental phase examination that are definitely normative are the parts where we assess things like apperception, grasp, abstract capacity, calculation, memory, etc. As I said, I don't think it's any accident that those are the closest to neurology and, uh, and are essentially uh, neurological aspects as well as psychiatric aspects. But that when it comes to the parts of the psychiatric examination which we need most, that then the examination defeats us. Things like affective capacities, coping mechanisms, blah, 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 which are of central interest to us as students of human nature. And I thought I'd illustrate that by taking up two of the parts of the mental state examination that you might contest, contest about with me. For example, insight. And I want to examine insight and, and cooperativeness or compliance to show what I think is the bankruptcy of this system. Insight is, 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 one, of the, is one of the ideas that's very central to the, to the mental state examination. Now, if you determine whether or not the patient has insight, Now, as far as I can tell, and I hope you'll enlighten me here, and I mean that, as far as I can tell, all the insight means is whether the patient, whether the physician agrees with the patient about the account of the illness. Well, that is, in itself is not a bad idea, but the trouble is that the psychiatrists themselves don't agree about the nature of the illness. So that we have there uh, an essentially fluid base. I mean, for example, if the patient thinks that the mother is to blame and you think the patient is to blame, in other words, if, this is, if one gives a social ideology and the other gives an intrapsychic ideology, I can say the patient doesn't have insight. But nevertheless, the patient may have insight. As long as we don't know what the ideology of mental illnesses is, and as long as e insight pertains partly to the concept of ideology, then it strikes me as, as bankrupt, as a basis for description of health. Well, you say that, that actually we're not that bad off, you say, because sometimes it pertains to, for example, whether the patient has insight into bizarre delusions. Does he know that the moon is not made of green cheese? And that's a characteristic thing. And we're going to come back to that in a little while. We talk about projection and forms of delusion. <coughs> But I think that that, although that does seem to offer a more substantial basis, notice it still depends upon there being a sort of a veridical world that everyone can agree about that the patient's delusions dispute. And that's a very difficult thing to determine. But, it, but it, of course, it does approach a little more closely something like it, a view of health. That is, we're all looking and thinking about the same real world whether there is really one real world out there that we look at, I've been disputing all along. I don't mean that there are many worlds out there, but, it, but it, that there's a sort of a static it that the ego looks at. I don't think that's an idea that anybody in modern thought has been very comfortable with for quite a long time. How are you using the term insight? Well, it seems like I'm thinking maybe using that as a too narrow. Maybe so. Go ahead. Well, um, I guess one way of looking at insight is whether the person externalizes responsibility for difficulties mm -hmm. or whether they see themselves as having some uh, part. Dissipation. Right. That would be insight. Uh, but would it be accurate insight? See, because well, the social psychiatric school doesn't regard responsibilities resting on individuals. So that would add another dimension to the whole concept of insight, of course, if there is presence or absence Right, but I would I would question either one of them. You know, I mean, the social psychiatric point of view is that you are not responsible. That the whole concept of personal individuality is is a sort of narcissistic plucking from the warp and woof of of systems of interactional systems. Why? I don't know that that's right. I don't think it's completely right. But, uh, 
you know, in a, in a school like psychoanalysis, which, which I like to characterize as one of the forms of rugged individualism, in which individuals are supposed to take responsibility for their drives, for their egos, for their superegos, which is this very heavy, almost Victorian conception of the, of the individual as a center of his own world, which is also, by the way, very existential. Then the question is, then one can say that, that we have to see our own part in the world and take responsibility for it. Do I make any sense? Well, I would take I would take issue with it too, but I'm just saying I don't know. I just don't know. I mean, I, th I think you're you're wise to put the descriptive psychiatry with the social psychiatry because neither one of them gives the individual much responsibility. You're not responsible for your disease. Is it taken with the responsibility, or just share the responsibility with other people? Well, that's a good point. There's certainly a great sharing in it. Mean, the individual is not helpless, but it's hard to find the individual. Systems theory. He's a point. Well, I think all the schools recognize interactions between systems and individuals, different, different points in uh, you know, the responsibility or necessary in order to have so called insight because it you know, varies with the theory or the clinician. So insight, it, insight would be a function of responsibility, not the other way around. That's yeah. Huh. Because but some, remember, some people take too much responsibility for themselves. For example, depressed people often blame themselves excessively. Is that a case of heightened insight? Hmm. Well, I was just going to say, the purpose of the mental status exam is to assign some sort of, you know, weight, I think, of whether or not the person's in the ballpark of understanding what's going on. I mean, does, it, do we, does anybody take it seriously? DSM-3 takes it very seriously. DSM-3 is largely built on it. Hmm? Hmm? On that insight? No, 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 that's just one part of it, but that's a significant part of it. DSM insight is often mentioned in DSM. Let me take another one. Take cooperativeness. That's something that even, you know, is, is often the first item in the examination. Now that's, there the problem comes from a different direction. Is the patient compliant? And notice the whole weight of the thing is on favoring the patient that's compliant. And if, if the patient is uncooperative, I mean, that's seen as, a, as an aspect of sickness. Now, I've already, I hope, amused you even with, with, with some of the wilder forms of obedience. Do you recall my talking about these Kreplinian tests for automatic obedience? You remember the patient, how many times the patient would stick his tongue out after you had struck it with a pin. That's what Kreplin used as a test of automatic obedience. That, I mean, he didn't mean automatic obedience, just you leave a limb in place. He had real automatic obedience then put that in your pipe and smoke it because how are you going to understand that? That there are people who put their tongue out so it's a bloody pulp. Is that the pontine lesion for tongue extrusion? How do you just understand that within the sort of dopamine theories of schizophrenia? Well, I suppose it's possible that it has some effect on obedience. It sounds to me like the person is scared to death. I mean, and of authority. Mm. But anyway, but if no, but I only mention that because, I mean, at one point, at one point in the descriptive system, compliance is seen as a as a as an attitude of health. The next minute is obviously an, an attitude of the gravest sickness. Well, then you say, well, a certain amount of obedience. Well, but as a matter of fact, you don't you don't quantitate them in the psychological examination. You're just pleased if the people answer the questions. Well, I've gradually. It dawned on me, I think it is a dawning, that, uh, in the sense of the truth, that, it's, that, it's, that health is very often much more indicated by the patient's refusal to answer questions. 
on being able to stand up for themselves, self-respect. But then you see we get into something that's associated with this, and that is that the patient is supposed to trust the doctor. Now, now that's pre-Watergate stuff, right? I mean, the modern world has realized, I mean, not only from the example of Watergate, but even more critically and significantly from the fact that the discovery that the parents did kill their children and break their bones, that you can't trust anybody. I mean, if you can't trust your mother not to break your, break your legs, why should you trust the doctor? Why should you trust anybody else? So that, and you see here, I'm already tickling Erickson's funny bone because it, you see how easily he snuck basic trust in as a concept of, of normal development. And there is a sense in which you need to have a certain amount of trust, but it's but it becomes very quickly, it seems to me, a way of knuckling under the authorities. Yeah, I don't know, say that you should have a little basic trust. He says that that's the issue. It's a continuum. You have to no, that's right. But but basic trust is represented as something that the individual has to develop. No? I think he has to deal with the issue. He might have to have basic trust or mistrust. Right. But but, but those but that's that, that is not an evenly balanced scale. One is seen as pathological, the other is normative. Just as generativity or whatever the opposite is, it's not, they're not equally balanced. No. I see your point, but I don't think that's the way he represents it, is he? I mean, like intimacy versus isolation. Intimacy is seen as a victory, no? I like your idea better, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's the way he sees it, is he? No, but I mean, if Erickson was here now, I don't think he would argue that complete and absolute trust. No, no, he wouldn't. Known. No, in fact, by by adding on an adjective like basic, you already qualify in some way. And I don't mean to be, you know, I know he's no damn fool, I know that. And yet the tendency of the thing seems to me in a particular direction. Now, maybe if you, I, I'd love to, to find that out. It'd make me much more comfortable with the system if it was really antinomies, you know, really uh, poles. I don't, no, I, I don't know what he would espouse if he were here. It seems to me a way of our modifying and looking at it with further information is to say, why not take those basic concepts and say, okay, here's something that is more ready than that. I, well, I think that's a very interesting idea. That's very appealing to me. I don't think that's what he's doing. I mean, he says the human being develops from basic tr trust through generativity. I think it is too. That's what I'm saying. But I want to shake. I want to shake us on that. I want to try to see if we can develop a system that is, is value free. I don't see where medicine has to do with those things. Let me go on a little longer. I'll try to tackle that more directly. I am. Um, Another example is that, uh, that this cooperativeness is sometimes seen in the mental status examination as a sign of sociability, for example. Now, sociability is a very important normative concept. Um, and when you ask yourself what kind of a person the patient is and how you're sizing them up, I've noticed that people tend to see the attitude toward the physician in the, in the examination, particularly it's co the patient's cooperative, as a sign of the patient's sociability. I find that I find that very misleading. Because of course we don't know by any means whether the patient is 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 being obedient. Again, repeating my same point, because they're terrified of us, or because there is any real sociability at all. And and I know lots of people, you bump into them particularly in a competitive academic environment, although I'm sure you bump into them also in the competitive commercial environments. But, um, but, um, but, um, 
I met many people who, who look like they have developed purposes of their own, i.e. that they, they bear a, uh, a self-respecting attitude toward the system. And they don't just obey the system, but they really are doing it for their own sakes. Well, and many very successful people look like that, and they put on the face of, of doing it for their, for their, because they want to. When in fact, when you get to know them better, they're terrified, and they're just doing it in order to please other people. And, um, and it's a very dangerous state to be in, of course, because automatic obedience in the academic competitive environment means that you get more and more heaped on top of you. And you'll make, you'll make your living if you stay around here and practice off Harvard people. You'll make your living off the number of them that crack because they've just said yes too often. And, uh, and then they, they, they break under that. And again, it's not uncommon. Um, now, you look at those people as they're running around doing other people's business. You know, you, you, you look at them and they look very sociable. But I don't think they have what's meant by a sociable relationship with their, with their jobs or their people at all. I think it's a sophisticated form of automatic obedience. Well, I'm just trying to in indicate that it's very hard to tell what people are up to. And that the idea of cooperativeness is by no means a very useful guide. In fact, as I'm pointing out, it can be a very misleading one. Well, that's what I'm going to move in that direction. There are two familiar things I should mention here, so that it doesn't, perhaps doesn't seem so weird, but it does seem weird. One is that, is that everybody says this, that, you know, that you ought to approach the patient with some idea of what the patient's health is, as well as their sickness. Everybody says that, but what I'm saying here is that, of course, that's true, but they give us no tools to do it with. And the second thing is that Thomas Zaz and, and R.D. Lang, to some extent, made a very large reputation by pointing out how the mental health system really was in the service of certain values, right? Social values, right? And that's, and that's been elaborately documented, right? And I, and I think he goes off the deep end in some respects, but he has there's an element of truth, which is what I'm exploiting <coughs> in, this, in this presentation. And I, but I don't agree with that, that, that all psychiatry has to be that way. But no, you're telling me that may be the case, and I, I can design something which is which is not in that system, and I, th I think you can do it. I look forward to seeing where you do them. Well, I'm <clears throat> another way of saying this, a more positive way of saying this, is that it seems to me that, that one would like to get out of the mental status examination, or any whatever you, want, whatever you want to call a reasonable approach to the patient, some notion of their connectedness, or sociability, if you like, but connectedness, I prefer. One would like to know that something about that. And it seems to me that it's not a foolish analogy to think that if you don't know about that, um, if you don't really know a great deal about that, you, it's like doing a physical examination leaving out the cardiovascular system. Now you say, oh well, we do find out about that because we take a social history and a sexual history and a work history, but the, but the historical reconstruction of those things is necessarily incomplete. And, you know, in, in you, you would not be entitled to leave the cardiovascular system out of your physical exam just because you were going to ask historically about symptoms of heart disease. Right? You'd have to test that out in your immediate contact with the patient. For one thing, because it, you, everybody says they have friends. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to find out what they mean. And historically, is in, in the historical situation is, of course, a perfect ground for what Harry Stack used to call a, a wonderful world of clinical fiction. So, uh, I, I'm going to take up the issue of self-protectiveness, too. And as I say, to me, it's when I, when I began to think hard about these things, even before, I suppose, and I began to question whether cooperativeness was really an important element of health. I said, well, of course it is to some extent. But I think if, if we were going to have a more sensible judgment, we'd, we'd do what you were suggesting around the Erickson thing. We'd also put next to, to cooperativeness its opposite, self-protectiveness. And then we might begin to get to form some judgment in the mental status examination of the, of the individual's human capacity. 
And I'm going to come back to that in considerable detail. Well, I, I want to make, <coughs> see if I can make my case for the, for the nature of the medical enterprise a little differently. Oh, very definitely. Right. I think that's uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. Well, all through this, I've been talking. I've been trying to, you know, sort of get, try to get us thinking about mind as an invasive substance. A, a invasive substance, a disappearing substance, a substance that can, that can be lost, etc. But definitely, it's invasiveness. Well, I was a. Uh, I've always been um, fascinated by Abraham Lincoln, and uh, of course, many times re reading about him, I am um, a very tragic figure. I um, learned a certain amount about his assassin. John Wilkes Booth was the brother, of course, of the famous Shakespearean actor Edwin Booth, and then uh, he he crawled, he climbed into there, walked into the. Lincoln's box at the Ford Theater that night and shot him and killed him. Remember? And, and when he um, when he went to the end of the box and leapt out of the stage, shouting, "Seek Semper Tyrannis!" Thus always, thus death to tyrant or something. Um, he broke his leg. It's not a surprising uh, result of a leap like that. And, uh, and in the few remaining weeks of his life before he was shot, remember, in the early time, um, he hobbled around on a broken leg. Well, uh, one of the debates I came upon when I was reading about these things was that it arose out of the fact that he went to a surgeon and had his legs set. Should, should the surgeon, and here's his mind, a little game for us to play. Should the surgeon have set John Wilkes' book, Booth's leg? I mean, this, I mean, maybe if you're a southerner, you think so, but that's not true, because the South was appalled at the murder of Lincoln. They knew immediately they were throwing in the hands of a much more dangerous character, Johnson. Jefferson Davis is supposed to have said his heart fell when he heard about the death of his enemy, Lincoln, but he knew it was his was this going to be his salvation. Hmm. So Booth didn't, wasn't even liked by the son of but, but should the surgeon have set John Wilkes Booth's leg? I mean, I think that's a good question. So that poses a political virtue, or a moral quality, right, versus a medical one. And it poses it in a nice point, because it, it discusses it around the man who killed the person many regard as the greatest American. Hmm? Nobody shot George Washington. He died with his false teeth out in Mount Vernon, so we don't have any much to say about that, about that man's demise. But we do about a great deal about Lincoln. And there was an effort made to get to get uh, the surgeon who set John Wilkes Booth's leg defrocked or delicensed, because that was regarded as something you didn't do. Well, that, we think of that as pretty ridiculous, don't we? Because medics in wartime treat both the foe and the friend alike so that the foe can get up and shoot you. Mm -hmm. well, that's medicine. Well, you see where I'm headed. I think medicine doesn't have any, doesn't, intends in, in its heart of hearts to, to avoid any kind of moral or political or judgmental basis. Right. Or what if you say, I'm on my way to shoot you, doctor? Well, I don't, I don't mean we don't call the policeman like any sensible person. But that's not, that's a judgment you make apart from medicine. Hmm? And we're not just doctors. And if the loony is coming at us with a knife, we don't you know, say, tell me what comes to mind. You know, we don't go on practicing our associated method, whatever it is we'd like to do, right? We get the hell out and call the police, like any sensible person. But that's not medicine at that moment. That's just, you know, survival. Mm -hmm. 
So medicine is strictly scientific. Medicine is strictly... Well, I, I don't know what medicine is, but it seems to me it has something to do with, with the survival of the species. It has something to do with protecting humans. It has something to do with health. But it, and it, but it doesn't say what you do with your health. It just gives it to you, it seems to me. And, um, and, and that's very important to medicine because if the patient suspects that you're going to use his sickness as a leverage to impose something on you, then it seems to me you're, the whole process of being treated is interfered with. So I think it, it, this is a very important thing. Now, it doesn't mean there aren't virtues. And in another capacity, we feel very strongly about something. But as physicians, it seems to me we do something quite different. Well, anyway, that's that's my that's the point of view I want to defend, and I and and, and that's what seems to me. If unless psychiatry is really to be a branch of religion or a branch of the state, which it seems to me is abhorrent. Um, I mean, if you want to get yourself a religion, that's one thing. But I didn't go to medical school for that. Either. In fact, that's one of the reasons I went to medical school was not to do that. But, uh, anyway, that's that's the so point. So we want a psychiatry free from values. Well, a psychiatry which which is aiming to empower or enable you, and doesn't judge what you do with your enablement, your capacity. I mean, the the, the surgeon that repairs Henry Kissinger's heart is really not asked to pass on his attitude toward the Russians. In fact, in fact, I wouldn't want to be in the presence of a surgeon who disagreed with my politics. You remember what I mean, whatever you may think of Ronald Reagan, he had this certain kind of weird sense every now and then. For example, when they, when they <coughs> ushered him into the George Washington operating room after he'd been shot, he looked up and he said, I hope you're not all, what was it, I hope you're all Republicans. Hmm? Well, that's a good illustration. I mean, you want to feel that the doctor doesn't care about it. <laughs> whatever you may think. Now, here's the President of the United States. I vote against the best, and I like to shoot him. But presumably, when he comes into that office, my ethics, my value, my politics, my morals have nothing to do with what I do. Well, the factor yes, exactly. Well, that's what I meant by the place that ethics actually enters medicine in its <coughs> discharging of, of moralizing. Right. No, that's that's where the is ethical is that, that you're disinterested. That's an ethic. That's a good ethic. That's a good ethic. That's a medical ethic. It isn't a good ethic to the Russians. The Russians don't think it's a good ethic apparently at all. They think that the that the physicians' uh, methods of treatment should correspond with with Marxist socialist view. And there's a place where you see when it, when the other thing takes over. But the body is somewhat like a machine. And an auto mechanic has a similar kind of mm -hmm. ethic that mm -hmm. doesn't care, you know, how you are trying to damage or wrong. When you try and say that the body is a similar kind of machine that you can approach. No, I'm gonna to try to do that. Well, <laughs> no, I know what you mean. I mean that's the problem, but you're right. You put your finger right on it. Um, there's a, an interesting article in the New Yorker recently um, by Bruno Bettelheim. Wonderful article. Um, you know the one he means? Well, what he des describes is how the original German texts of Freud's writings um, have a very different slant than their English translations in that um, certain words appear like soul, um, mm -hmm. which never... Uh, managed to warm its way into the English. Mm -hmm. And by reading the English translations, you get a very mechanistic feeling. Um, and that Freud was trying to do a sort of plumber's guide to human personality. Whereas really, um, it had more of a, a spiritual flavor in the German. And that um, ego was not the sort of reified structure, but it, it was the I. And, as, as in single letter I, and the, the, it was the it. Um, but that somehow... Where the I is, where the it was, there shall the I be. See how existential that sounds? Hmm. However, what's the matter with that? 
that argument of Betelheim. It's a beautiful, you know, I, I bet he was stimulated by reading those awful things by Janet Malcolm on uh, Dr. Green, who's a New York <laughs> analytic, who's the most mechanical person alive. But what's the matter with that? The matter is Freud spoke excellent English and accepted those translations completely. Well, Freud was a, you know, great thing about Freud is he could play both sides of the fence. Mm. And you don't blame him. I mean, what the hell? It's a big ball. You know, it's like saying, somebody once said to me, the trouble with you, Havens, is you touched all the bases, you know, meaning that I was sort of too even handled. Well, I said, if you're going to hit the ball a long way, you better touch all the bases, right? But that does leave you in the position of being on an awful lot of sides of the same issue. Yeah, I mean, mm. he, he lays claim to the title of scientist and yet was one of the biggest mystics who ever lived. That's right. Now, when, when it's convenient... Wouldn't it mystic? Would yeah. it, not mystic, but anyway. Yeah. Well, it's not mystic. mystic was. He was possessed with the idea of immortality and into numerology and yeah. all sorts well, of things. A lot of mystical things mystical. about him. I don't think Bedlam is saying that exactly. What he's saying is humanistic, right? Mm -hmm. But he's both. And, and it, it's convenient, I'm afraid, at this point, to emphasize the humanism and forget what he was very eager into, the, the, uh, the mechanical, hydraulic stuff. Too. Mm -hmm. I think he. I think he's a little. I think he's a little canny on it. Although it's a marvelous account and very persuasive, as you know, Betelheim is a is a great uh, arguer. Putting aside mm -hmm. Freud and Betelheim for a minute, I want to just suggest that when you try to wash away all the values mm -hmm. from your practice of psychotherapy, um, you you may end up. Um, empowering your patient less, mm -hmm. or helping him to get that empowerment less than mm -hmm. if you somehow acknowledge that there that there's more than simply um, trying to get him to a state where he can then go on to do it himself and make all sorts of well, decisions. Well, I'm not, I'm not questioning for a moment that you throw away powers. I mean, the power of the church is the mightiest power in human history, right? I mean, you can't. Uh, the power of Adolf Hitler to persuade is the mightiest thing in, in, the, in the history of the 1930s, right? Yeah, but you're going to throw that away, please. Hmm? Oh, I don't mean you don't. There's an awful lot of things that will persuade people much more powerfully than psychotherapy. Take a gun, for example. Hmm? Hmm? You throw that away. I'm, I'm not necessarily hmm? talking about hmm? Hmm? persuading people, well, but what I am talking about... Empowering. Is having a, a real strong focus on the values in their life. Um, look at what they want to do with their life. And oh, well, I mean, that's, if you enable, you, I think I agree with you, that you're trying to help people to get with the, what it is they want. Well, we, maybe, let me see if I, if you think I can pull it off, because I'm, I uh, probably can't, I probably can't. Fortunately, I'm no, I'm not in my danger of doing too much to that. I'm making a fool of myself. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, uh, okay, we're going to, I'm going to propose that, that we describe a normative, normative conception in terms of what the mind can do, okay? Um, 
I will try to, uh, I will suggest the notion that we want to be comparable to determining the range of motion of a limb. Mm -hmm. I'll come back to the range of motion a lot. But, uh, that we want to determine whether uh, whether the mind whether the mind can do certain things. What is the mind should be able to do, and whether it's doing it. I think that's more in our bailiwick. Um, that's a problem, isn't it? Um, some people can run can run a mile in less than four minutes. Hmm? I can hardly run a mile at all. My body can't do that. And yet that's not an evidence of sickness. Maybe someday it will, if everybody keeps jogging at the rate they're doing. But it's not yet. I mean, I can see where it might become I mean, in a culture which society in which the standards of health keep rising and you're expected to live to 120 or something. People like myself will be regarded as, uh, as throwbacks, huh? or at least not throw forwards. Um, and then, of course, there are some minds that, that can remember almost everything they've, they've written or read, or can, can figure out the consequences of chess moves, up to 25 different moves. Now, those are standards I just simply do not want to have to measure up to, although they're things minds can do. So we're going to have to find a place here that, uh, that uh, gives us uh, more comfort. Um, my father used to tell a joke about the Scottish physician who, uh, his patient, complained that he, she couldn't put her hands over her head, and, uh, and the Scottish physician told her that perhaps she should keep them without pain. She couldn't pained her to put her hands over her head, and the Scottish physician is supposed to have told her that perhaps she should keep them down by her side. Well, it's, it seems to me that's sort of the boat most of us are in. I mean, um, there are just certain things we shouldn't try to do, right? And if I tried to run a mile in less than four minutes, I, I mean, I wouldn't even get near it, of course, but I mean, it wouldn't be good for me even. Hmm? And it seems to me that's more the ordinary condition of human health. Or certain feats you just should not undertake. Well, what should we what should we be trying to do anyway? Well, Freud, in a kind of offhand way, once said that you should, you should that the normal person should be able to love and work. It's a very offhand <coughs> kind of comment. You know, when you get to be as famous as he was, it, people pay attention to everything you say. I remember when I was growing up, someone once asked the world's heavyweight championship, Joe Lewis, what he thought of atomic energy. Well, he mother, he was almost unintelligent in his speech anyway, but he mumbled something that they wrote down and it was radioed all around the country. Well, that's a function of a certain amount of fame. Well, it may be appropriate that a good man, a great mental power like Freud, and a man like a great physical power like Joe Lewis should be conversing on mental health and physical gigantic explosions or something. I don't know that's made with some line in there, perhaps. But on the whole, it was an offhand comment by Freud, and maybe you shouldn't pay much attention. But then we move along a little bit in history psychoanalysis and, and uh, we get more and more and more advice, you know. The adult person is supposed to be capable of autom autonomy, intimacy, generativity, integrity. And it begins to look like a very formidable matter indeed. The existentialists are uh, the same way, aren't they? Um, they, d they? They dress it up in a way that's very appealing to me, but it really is a kind of a dressing, I think. That is, that human beings as the modes of being in the world. Ready? The modes of being in the world involve um, the capacity to move through time and space, well, not just physically, not primarily physically, but imaginatively. They also involve affective attunement with others, the tolerance of uncertainty, even mortality, things like that. Now, those are the existential views of human being, by which they mean the way you ought to be, the way the true human is, snuck in there. Well, I don't know. I, I, none of those things make me very comfortable. I mean, I mean I, I'm, I'm not a member of the landed gentry, for example. I didn't marry money. Um, so I have to work. But I don't, does everybody have to work? Mm -hmm. It seems like an awful bore. Um, uh, I know lives that are so riddled by uncertainty and mortality that I wouldn't want to live them. Does everybody have to live them? 
intolerable. But, you know, I think one of the ways you can tell moralism is that there's always a sort of a grim note. You notice that? That whenever you feel like you're not quite measuring up, you're in the present. But, right, I mean, in all fairness to Children's Hospital, next door is the leukemia ward. Uh, yeah, right. Which, That's uh, right. It's grim, and it's not, I don't think there's any... They don't like it, do they? I mean, I hope they're not, they're not enjoying the grimness. They're enduring it. They're not imposing it. Hmm? Hmm? I don't know, medicine. Sometimes when you you watch these joggers' faces, they have the the Porter Square Marathon. I live on Brattle Street, and they had the Porter Square Marathon. I was out gardening one day, and the people came by. Jesus Christ, I thought I was in the zoo. <laughs> I mean, these people hobbling along, strange, thin faces. I mean, I never saw such an unhappy, wretched, wretched people. Don't go to the, don't have anything to do with the Porter Square Marathon. One of my, two of my daughters ran, one of my daughters ran one year in the Bonnie Bell. I was great. They looked like they were interested where they got that look from the water <laughs> So, well, you know, one of the things you'd like, that is, I would like, you know, some kind of way of knowing, not just having a list of, of things you ought to be, but um, having really a grip on the idea of how you would sort of test for them. That's another part of it. How do you decide someone's integrity in an interview? Try it sometime. Good luck. I don't think you're going to do it. So again, I mean, the medical thing seems to me that you want some kind of view of, of the normative which you can use, hmm? like testing for the range of motion in the limb. Anybody can do that. Some tests get very elaborate. You can learn them. Technicians can learn them. So you'd want something that was testable. I would, that's just one of the troubles with psychoanalysis. See, psychoanalysis has always claimed, that, or at least most of the time has claimed, that, that you might not be able to find out the nature of the sickness until the psychoanalytic process was more or less over. That's in the book. Now that's terrifying. Carl it's a good point, but it's even more frightening as medicine because look what happens. Um, not, only, not only do in many cases you find out what the illness is and then you find out you can't treat it with psychoanalysis, right? Furthermore, you never know whether the process created the illness or uncovered the illness. And by that time, the patient may be so broke or so crazy that there's no other people that don't work either. So that's, a, that's, a, that's not what you want as a test of health. Now, don't blame psychoanalysis exclusively. That's what surgeons also do, you know. In the course of trying to find the tumor and remove it, you know, the old joke, the operation was a success, but the patient died, and that happens all the time, right? So this thing about psychoanalysis is by no means restricted to that. It, it's a feature of all heroic procedures, so-called, in which the hero is the doctor, <laughs> and the battleground is you, know, you and me. <laughs> So we like we like something that was not grim, not moralistic, and practical. Well, I'm trying to um, I want to suggest three or four things as a sort of a sketch of what that might be like. We'll call the first of them range of motion. That that sneaks into physicalistic solidity that I feel always right. Um, Range of motion. What's the patient's range of motion? Well, I'd like to be able to find out whether the patient can get close and also whether the patient can go away. That's one. I'd like to build that into the mental status. Now, how do you find out whether someone, uh, do they, well, I mean, let's take the, the second one first. 
What about people that, uh, there are people that move right in, right? You can tell right away they don't have any trouble with closeness. I mean, they may not, they may not deal with it very well, but they produce it immediately. They move right in on us, right? You can feel them, you can see it in their eyes. They can even move up close to you. And, and they make you feel like leaving, right? And, and by the way, that's not a bad idea. And, and it's, it's also a good test because if you leave, you go out of your office, and you know what happens? They follow you right down the hall. In other words, they need closeness. Mm -hmm. Now, we like to know whether they can stand distance. Well, that suggests that they have a trouble with it anyway, right? So that there's a loss of range of motion, is what I'm saying there. Right? That's, a, that's a, very, uh, uh, a very easy thing to test for. You don't have to leave your office to do it. Just um, do this sometime. When they're moving in on you, just get abstracted. Don't pay attention. Above all, don't be attentive. Look like you, you were trying to remember where you left your wallet. I mean, something important like that. Hmm? Um, and watch what they do. And when they, when they, and this is a test for the need for, in, uh, compulsive need for closeness, right? Lack of range of motion. And if you do that, and what they'll do is they'll move right in. They, they can see they can't find you from there. They, they, they'll begin to ask you, are you paying attention? Oh, uh, and they may even move their chair closer. And they, and they make it a little anxious and bewildered because what have you done? You, you've left them alone. Mm -hmm. so I could have started out by saying, we'd like to know whether someone could be alone. That's a good human capacity, right? We'd also like to know whether people can laugh and have fun, right? We want to build that into our mental state too. As well as imaginativeness and this thing I call a range of motion. Can't, now, it doesn't look maybe this person can't be alone because I, I mean I just really I just I just went out of the room for a moment, <laughs> you know. In fact, I didn't even leave the room, but I went out of the room, you know. And, and boy, did it produce a little panic over there. So, so you're saying if someone can't stand the alone, that that would be unhealthy. Well, it would be a sign of something special about them, right? Well, they have health, yeah. That's what you're in, saying. Yeah, that's really what I'm saying. But then, but see, isn't that a, some kind of a moral decision? It's not a scientific. You haven't gone out and tested 100,000 people to find out what's close and what's far away. No, I haven't. So that's not scientific. Well, I'm not, I've never used the word science. I just, I, I just didn't well, want to use the word moral. You know, there are not two poles, science and... No, it's no. got to be a value. Oh, no. Everything that isn't science isn't valuable. But you're, but you're saying that somehow you're setting up a priori that closeness. Suppose you there was the, a, the a range, country so. or a, or well, I said range of motion. No, no, I didn't. I, I think being close is a. You see, one reason I started out that way was we usually, you know, can the patient be intimate? Can they be close? There's nothing wrong with being able to be close. But the point is that they, it's not that they that they're that they have to be. It's not that they're being close is sick. It's that they're not being distant is sick. Mm -hmm. That they've lost that range of motion. Yeah, but you're still setting it up a priori. What if a, a country well, that was any, the culture? Anything can be a value. I mean, having, having a good, uh, you know, creatinine clearance test is a value, right? And if that's not what we mean by ethics. Hmm? It's, it's wonderful to have a good creatinine clearance test. I mean, you've all probably had a good test. Congratulations. <laughs> I mean, it isn't. It isn't. It is, I don't think it's ethics. I mean, you could say the ethics of the creatinine clearance. I mean, the, the kidney clinic is a big uh, test your creatinine clearance. And that, that's something that becomes ethics. And there are people whose whole lives, you know, these professional patients whose lives are built around the value of getting a good creatinine clearance. So you can, you can make it into that. I don't think that's the same thing. It might be chopping up the Maybe so. Well, I mean, now, let me, I'm, I don't, I'm not derailed by that. I thought ten people might feel that way. Um, and then you meet people that can't be close at all, right? How do you test for that? We want to, remember, we don't, well, we, we want to have the concept of range motion. We also want to have a, a sensible test for it. Right? Well, I suggest you do this. I'll make some empathic remarks and see if they let you stay. Now, maybe you can't stay yourself. The doctor has to be able to do the test, too. Um, but 
if you can you make a series of empathic remarks, what happens to the patient? Some people are remarkable. They immediately distance themselves from you when you move closer. And notice what a remarkable affective attunement that is. Because they must have a, an absolutely accurate perception of how close you are in order to get away that far, right? Other people don't have that, that kind of attunement. And when you go close, they let you in, then they're embarrassed, and then they run. They don't have that kind of perceptiveness about where you are that other people do. So there's somebody that can't, won't allow you close, just as the other one won't allow you distance. Right? I call that limitation of the rate of motion. Well, that's, that's a problem that medicine has always been beleaguered by. And, and you can say, well, there isn't such a thing as medicine until you have quantitative tests. But that means that there was no medicine before about 1920. You know, I don't know whether they, what they still teach in medical school. But, you know, when I was taking medicine, you, you, a lot of what you knew about the lung was, you know, what you learned by percussion and auscultation. And there's no way to quantify it. And yet they give you, you know, information that could be quite similar. That is, I think, precisely the point that uh, what you call close, I may call this. Yes, that's right. possible. And what you may call a mass, you know, I don't remember those arguments in the introduction of clinical medicine as to whether the person had a third sound or not. I mean, I never heard a third sound. I never heard it. I used to say that. <laughs> I mean, I never heard that kind of thing, right? right? And, and there are people that they, either they're better liars than I was, and the whole thing is a fraud that someone thought up, you know, was going to make his name or something. So, but it's somebody sound. And, you know, if you look very serious and say, I heard a third sound, a lot of people are very embarrassed when they can't hear it until they say, I heard a third sound. And it begins to get into the literature. That's a very common one. You, I've heard a presentation by one of your colleagues today about in which they tried to explain why the phenothiazine wasn't working, and they said, well, there's a certain enzyme in the liver that breaks down this thing, it isn't functioning, if we give a different one to function. And it was this elaborate system being built up. The assumption of which was that the phenothiazines work. Well, phenothiazines have some effect, but they're very limited. So how do you know that they work or didn't work? It's very difficult to tell. But if you've got enough enzymes that you can keep feeding in, you can build up this structure. And I don't mean that my structure isn't just as Jerry built as that one. But you can measure how well the heart is working by function, but you can't measure how close the closeness it is. Well, so you set up, you set well, up why do you need to over. measure it? But, but well, you, have to, you have to have some, no, it is, it is a kind of measurement. It may be a clinical impression measurement. But you know, you do say those things about people. This one is distant, this one is close. And you're measuring it. And that's all we've got. And if you don't like it, I mean, you're in the wrong field. I mean, and you can go measure all the brain chemical if you want, but until you can really relate them, you're still just hoping. But this is what you've got. And when you're out there practicing and the patient comes in and you can't just keep referring them back to the laboratory to another test, you know, you've got to make up your mind where they're closer distant. With what you've got, just like the old thoracic people, they had to go, because God damn it, they're going to get that bloody effusion out of there. You've got to know where it was. And if you say, well, that's not very quantitative, well, tough shit. Hmm? You never have a consensus in medicine. I used to listen to old hands arguing about whether there was a fluid level and wasn't. Right? But, it, but you know, you can, you can more or less make it, make make your way. And that's about where we are in psychiatry. Well, let's say you make your way to the consensus, right? consensus there. Then you can do something, I think, like this Oh, I think there's definitely consensus in what insight is in DSM-3. But the trouble with the DSM, but the consensus is the objective descriptive psychiatrist. And they have no consensus in the analysts in them. That's the only trouble with that. And you can say, well, the others are all crazy, but that's, we're now we're back in sectarianism. Oh, there's definitely, once you get inside the system, there's great sectarianism. Yeah, I mean, there's great... Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping that that isn't the case. I mean, make an empathic statement and see what the, what happens. And that's a testing. And you, you, how do you know? Well, I've told you how you can tell whether you're empathic 
remarkably successful, i.e., that you've established successful empathy, right? Remember that gave you some tests, which was whether you began to feel what the patient <coughs> feels. You read the, 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 off the dial of your own reactions, whether you can complete their sentences. That's, a, that's a just about as quantitative as anything. I mustn't get hot out of the car. It's good not to get hot out of the car. That's a value for you. But, but I, I don't know. So that, that would be one thing. If you're interested at all, we'd go on uh, talking about it. There are other ways to explore the range of motion. Maybe I'll get around to those ones. You're not solely stuck with either abstracting yourself or empathizing as means of seeing whether the patient pursues you or whether they run away from you. The problem is you, your goal <coughs> seems to be trying to get away from choose those to begin with. And that's the person, they the person can be close, but they have to be close. I asked you whether if they weren't close, that was a sign of sickness. If they weren't close. If they didn't have the capacity to be close, close. close. to be close. Right. That would be Which, which is... The result of the question is, how do you then determine whether or not they're just choosing not to show their ability? That's a very real problem. That's a very real problem. And we're going to have to get to that. The whole yeah. issue of, of genuineness. Right. And that's a problem that you get to whenever, when you're assessing any psychological function. You know, when you ask a person to repeat digits, you know, you think that maybe that's easy to measure. You're also running up against motivation. Sure, that's well, motivation. And the same thing comes in measure. You know, I say, I don't even have range of motion. How do you know I'm trying? It's a problem. And whenever you get, I think, the really meaningful um, psychological function, they're very difficult to measure. You know, insight, you know, how are you going to measure that? Mm -hmm. um, the mental status, insight, is whether or not you know you're sick. That's a and what you mean by sick is... Right, what you think. It's what you think. It's what you think. Yeah, yeah. Well, I agree. That's one of my starting points. 
But all no. this is very different than prescribing a particular psychological function. Right? Like that you're supposed to cooperate, or you're supposed to be close. Or you're supposed to be That's generous. That's what I'm trying to escape. That seems to be more clearly valid. Hmm? Well, it's all right if you're saying, if you're looking at it as a function, but when you get to the end of the spectrum, you're saying that not closeness is sickness, then you're saying... No. Range of motion. I mean, why? Yeah, I mean, close. Close. That's why. That's why I say range of motion. I know. I don't think. I don't think it's our business to say that this person should be close with me or anyone else. That's why I didn't like the idea of, of worker love. You have to work. <laughs> I mean, I've been sort of trying to get out of that for years. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we'll go on if you can stand. Please.